Hello, and welcome to Speaking of Authors. I'm Susan Tarnowski, and in collaboration with the City of Edina, we present this series. In Speaking of Authors, we hope to tell all of the stories, the story the author wrote, the story the author lived, how the author writes, where they write, what makes them be an author in their context, and how the listener interacts with that author. Today we are very privileged to have author William Kent Kruger with us. William Kent Kruger is a multi-award winning author who has endeared himself in the hearts of many people. They come to love the universe that Kruger created that is inhabited by P.I. Cork O'Connor. People identify with the characters and they enjoy life with them and they are sad about their lives when those lives are sad. I think sometimes, however, people can step back from reading and be in awe of the craft of an author. That happened to me with Ordinary Grace and its companion volume, This Tender Land. It was truly extraordinary storytelling. Today, Barbara Lavalure will speak with our author, William Kent Kruger, about his newest Cork O'Connor book. Let's just get to that conversation. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Susan, and yes, let's. Let's do that. Let's bring in Kent, and I'm just excited to see what he has to say today. Thank you, Susan, for your introduction. And now we get to speak with Kent, William Kent Kruger. And I take it I can call you Kent. I've always, with the exception of my seventh grade year, I've always gone by Kent. In the seventh grade, I tried Bill for a year. It didn't take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Well, it's just really lovely to see you again. And welcome to Speaking of Authors. A pleasure to be with you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, we go back a ways, don't we? Indeed, we do. So years ago, I was the executive director of a nonprofit on the east side of St. Paul, and we cared for seniors, and Kent's father was one of our seniors. So on our first visit there, we were having this great conversation, just getting to know each other, and um, he kind of paused and said, have you ever heard of William Kent Kruger? And uh, the coin didn't drop, I'm afraid, uh, with the last name. And I said, uh, uh, no, no, I, I haven't. And he, he got up from his chair and he walked into another room. And when he came back, he had a copy of um, your first book. I think that was This Tender Land. Iron Lake. I, Iron, Iron Lake. Iron oh, Lake. yes, there it is right there. Yep. Silly me. So Iron Lake. Um, and he said, that's my son. <laughs> He was so proud. It was it was really sweet. So anyway, I took the book home and well, it's not that book, actually, because I, I, I read the book and I have continued to follow Cork O'Connor for uh, for all these years. And I have I returned his book, but I went out and bought bought my own copy and I have bought every one of your 21 books, including your new book, which is Lightning Strike, which I just finished a couple of days ago. Oh, I hope you liked it. Oh, I did. And what was so interesting about that was that um, it took Cork to uh, back to when he was a young lad. So, yeah, it's a prequel to the series. Yes, and that was really fun because there were um, a couple of characters that you were able to highlight that haven't been in subsequent books, as, uh, at least not, not that much. Or have been referenced because they've passed away by yes. the time the current Day Cork O'Connor series exactly. uh, takes place. Exactly. So, well, needless to say, you're my favorite Minnesota uh, author. And oh, so, wonderful. Yes, and I can say that with, with all With, with all a straight honesty. face. Yes, I can. <laughs> I really can. Um, uh, what about um, Ordinary Grace? I, I'd like you to tell a little bit about that because that is a very different book. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and share a little bit about Ordinary Grace? 
You know, if, if you are familiar with my Cork O'Connor series, uh, you may be aware that, as, as you are familiar with my Cork O'Connor series, you may be aware that um, very often in the stories, there's an undercurrent that deals with the spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. It's something that comes very naturally for Cork O'Connor because he's a man of mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. Um, so he's a man with a foot in two different spiritual traditions, his white Catholicism, Irish Catholic, and his Ojibwe spirituality. So very often in those stories, um, there's an undercurrent that deals with Cork trying to figure out where his unique spiritual path lies. And that's been an issue for me my whole life. Uh, about 12 years ago, a story idea came to me that wasn't a Cork O'Connor story, um, but it, uh, it was a story that I believed would allow me to explore more deeply the importance of the spiritual journey in our lives. I think we're all on a spiritual journey, whether we embrace that or not. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the story was, uh, it eventually became Ordinary Grace. Um, I gotta tell you this, when I, when I proposed that project to my publisher, they didn't want it. In fact, they, they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic and, and set me down and said, Kent, you have to understand, we only want Cork O'Connor stories from you. So I knew if I, uh, if I wrote this piece, it was going to be a risky proposition. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they weren't interested. I had no idea if anybody else would be interested. But it was a story that spoke to me in such a compelling way that I knew I had to write it. So across the next three years, without a contract, I composed the manuscript for Ordinary Grace. Um, when it was finished, even though my publisher had said they didn't want it. I went ahead and sent it to my editor at Simon & Schuster. She fell in love with it, and she said, of course, we're going to publish it, and, uh, and they did, and Ordinary <laughs> Grace has just had this remarkable reception. Uh, I remember when, when it came out, it was actually one of the, our all-church reads, and you came to our church and, and spoke. And, which church was that? Uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church. Oh, sure, I remember speaking there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Big church. Yes, very big church, and lots of people read that book as a result. So, well, um, why don't you tell our our viewers about Cork O'Connor and uh, and Aurora? And I'm I'm curious to know if Aurora is based on a a real place <laughs> in northern Minnesota, or if it's a figment of your imagination, which is clearly very vivid. Well, anybody who knows the Arrowhead of Minnesota knows there is a real. Aurora, Minnesota, but that's not my Aurora. Yeah. Uh, my Aurora is an amalgam of elements of so many of the Northwoods towns that I've come to know and love. Um, I wanted to create a fictional town because I didn't want readers to be tied to any geographic realities because I monkey with the geography of northern Minnesota a good deal for the stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted anyone who knows the North Country to be able to read about Aurora and see that it clearly is an authentic Northwoods town, but they couldn't say, oh, it's Ely, or it's mm -hmm. Babbitt, or it's Virginia, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I created my, my Aurora using the name of a real town up there, even though I knew it might be confusing, but only for readers who know mm -hmm. that part of Minnesota. Um, Cork O'Connor, who occupies center stage in the series, is, um, as I indicated earlier, a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe. He is the former sheriff of the fictional Tamarack County. Um, he's a family man, as I am. Uh, he, in, initially in the series, is married to a blonde attorney, as I am. He has children, as I do. So a lot of who Cork is comes out of who I am. The way Cork sees the world is pretty much the way I see the world. Cork believes that, um, that we're put on this earth to seek justice for others, and I believe that as well. Uh, Cork believes that, um, that you make commitments in life, and come hell or high water, you stand by those commitments, and I believe that too. Cork, uh, Cork understands that in this life, here on this earth, Family really is the most significant relationship that we are going to know, and I believe that as well. So Cork comes out of a lot of who I am and how I perceive the world, but he's, his shoulders are so much broader than mine. Cork takes on so many things that I would never take on, um, but I, love, I really love spending time with him. He's a guy who is always trying to do the right thing mm even though he's not always sure what that is. 
but that's what he's trying to do. And I think, I think most of us are like Cork. Well, uh, what about um, some of the other characters? Are, are those all, um, you know, amalgam of other people or are they all just made up personalities? Because you've got some other strong characters um, in, in the book. Yeah, initially Cork's family was really based a lot on my family. Mm -hmm. his, uh, his oldest daughter, Jenny, was a lot like my oldest daughter. Uh, his son, Stephen, was a lot like, in the beginning, a lot like my son. Um, most of the other characters, however, are creations for the sake of the series. That said, you know, they possess traits that are real in terms of most human beings, with, with maybe the one exception being Henry Maldu. Mm. Uh, for, re, for folks out there who might not be familiar with my series, uh, Henry is, uh, he's the nearest thing I write to a stock character, the wise old medicine man. Henry is in fact uh, a, a mide. He's a member of the Grand Medicine Society. He's a healer. He's also uh, well over 100 years old now. Uh, he's, uh, he's compassionate and he's wise and he's brave and he's funny and he farts a lot. Um, and he, he exists. I know that because I've had uh, a number of my native readers tell me, oh, oh, that's our elder so-and-so. So I know he's out there. I don't know him personally. He just was one of those blessings that came to me as a storyteller. And I have taken advantage of him enormously in, in the course of the stories. The, um, Henry is definitely my second favorite character. I, I absolutely adore him and the way he thinks, which is, um, is all, that he always has such wise things that he says. Yeah, Cork comes to him always when he's, often when he's, everything's all knotted up and he doesn't, he doesn't know how to unravel whatever's going on. And Henry, doesn't give him answers. Typically, Henry will pose um, a riddle to him, of some kind of riddle. Mm -hmm. And when Cork has solved the riddle, he understands the wisdom that Malou is offering him. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the characters as well as the descriptions that you use about all kinds of things, people, places, events, um, consistent throughout all the series? I mean, does, does the computer help with that? Or do you have to remember that? Or do you have files about this character and that character and that town? Or, I mean, how, how does that work? You know, so many of my colleagues uh, have told me that right from the very beginning, they have kept dossiers on their characters, <laughs> files on, uh, yes. on places and how they were created and where they are. Wouldn't that have been a good idea? <laughs> no, oh, I, I have never done you that. You didn't do that. <laughs> and so, uh, generally speaking, I rely on memory. I often have to go back into other books and reread to see, okay, how did I create this character? Uh, what's the relationship? Where did the relationship come from? Where is this place? That kind of a thing. And I have to admit, sometimes I get it wrong. And whenever I do, readers will write to me and tell me about it. And uh, ah. yeah, so that uh, that's usually after the hardcover comes out. So then I try to get it corrected before the paperback comes out. So I uh, slip up occasionally. Yeah. But you know, I've been writing this series for a quarter of a century. Uh, sometimes my memory isn't as good as it uh, used to be. Yeah. You know, speaking of writing, and as a writer myself, um, I, I read a long time ago that you used to write uh, uh, with your laptop in a cafe in St. Paul. But that cafe closed, didn't it? Yeah, and it wasn't with a laptop in the beginning. Oh. Oh. It was notebook and pen. Oh, my. Oh. Uh, I wrote okay. my first nine novels longhand at the St. Clair Broiler in St. In St. Paul, this iconic cafe in St. Paul. Longhand. Yeah, longhand. And then, wow. uh, <laughs> you know, if you, if you write longhand, there's that step that requires transcribing it into a word processor right. of some kind, computer or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, which takes time, and I, I happen to be behind deadline. And I thought, well, if I could skip that, that step, maybe I could actually meet deadline. So I thought, well, let's give it a try. And so we had laptops by then. I tried composing directly to the laptop, laptop which was a scary proposition for me because writing longhand was a part of the magic, part of the ritual. You know, it was like the, the idea 
started here and it passed through my heart, down my arm, through the pen, onto the page. And I was really concerned if I monkeyed with the magic, maybe it would stop. Eh, it didn't happen. No. I, so now I, I <laughs> write directly to the laptop. But yeah, uh, I still write in coffee shops. I still do all of my creative work in coffee shops. It's just on a laptop now. And the outside noise or other people don't disturb you or come up to you and say, oh, Kent, I recognize you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from what, whatever. Yeah, particularly at the broiler when it became fairly well known. I done, I did uh, lots of interviews there for, uh, you know, the news or, or journals, journalists or whatever. Uh, it became well known that I did my writing at the broiler. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't uncommon at all for someone to step up to the booth where I wrote every morning. But they were almost always very respectful. They just you know, told me I, I appreciate your work, or they brought a book and they asked me to sign it. Mm -hmm. So it, it really has never been a problem. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I, I just think that you're um, a master of, of description. And, you know, I, you, you wrote in one line, his eyes were two dark almonds in a face. I thought that was really cool. Um, <laughs> you're I, easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that... Um, the uh, you've been on the New York Times bestseller list uh, how many times? Nine or ten times now. Oh my goodness, what what an honor that is! Yeah. I, so how how what was the first book that that in which that occurred? Number ten in my series, a book called Vermilion Drift, and let me tell you the story of that, because it involves my father. So uh, so Vermilion Drift came out number ten in my series. And a couple, uh, week or so after it came out, I happened to be downstairs in our basement doing my father's laundry because my father lived with us for the last four years of his life. I was his primary caregiver. So I was downstairs doing the laundry, my father's laundry. And as I was beginning to take his clothes from the washing machine and put him into the dryer, I had my cell phone with me, I got a call. And it was my editor at Simon & Schuster calling to inform me that I'd hit the New York Times bestseller list with Vermilion Drift. And I was ecstatic. I was overjoyed. It was such a delight. It was something that I always hoped. Yeah. We ended our conversation, and I went back to doing my dad's laundry, <laughs> you know? I, it just gave me mm -hmm. chills, actually, just hearing that, because, um, I mean, what an honor. And then to have it repeated so many times. Did that happen for Ordinary Grace, just as a matter of interest? It did. It was hit the New York Times list, not as high as I had hoped it might hit. Uh, but a lot of that was because it was published during a period of time when my publisher and Barnes & Noble were at odds with one another over what's called co-op money. Mm -hmm. And during that period, Barnes & Noble uh, had given instructions that none of their stores were to buy more than one copy of a Simon & Schuster author's work. Wow. So. Typically, Barnes & Noble is a huge purchaser of my work, which contributes to being on the New York Times list, and they just didn't do it. I still hit the list. I think I was at, I think I hit it number 18 with Ordinary Grace. Mm -hmm. Just, I had hoped it would be much higher than that. Mm -hmm. well, on the other hand, still. It's, uh, it, is, uh, it continues to be a huge, it's sold over a million copies so far. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's done all right. Yeah. Um, uh, in a later chapter, I think it was chapter 32, um, your delightful character, Grandma uh, Dilsey, is that right, Dilsey? Yeah. And Cork, this is now young Cork from, from uh, Lightning Strike. Cork at 12 years of age. Right. Um, they're on their way to, uh, to pick blueberries, and, and, and you wrote, the air that poured in smelled fresh and hopeful. How does air smell hopeful? Well, any sensual experience is colored by your emotional state of mind, I think. Mm -hmm. And so if you're smelling this fresh air, particularly if you understand the environment surrounding Cork at the time he and his grandmother go mm -hmm. blueberry picking, it's full of contention. Yes. And the air is different now. It feels different. Life feels hopeful to him. Mm -hmm. So he translates it into the air. Um, so. She's really quite a fascinating character. Mm -hmm. I love Grandma Dilsey. Yes. Strong. I did too. Yes, I always love a strong, strong woman. smart, mm. erudite. And she is and not afraid o to and speak And a full up. blood, a true blood Iron Lake Ojibwe. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but she's not in all your books. No. She's often referenced in my stories, but mm -hmm. she has passed away long before uh, the current books in the Cork O'Connor series take place. 
Uh, one of the, the reasons that I was so drawn to her be, is because she points out almost every time she speaks up about the injustices done to um, her people over the centuries. So um, is she based on a, a real character? She's based on a number of strong Ojibwe women that I know. Mm -hmm. okay. how, how do you stay true to the Native culture? Do you, you, know, do you seek out Native friends or, or what, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I do have friends in the Native community who help me a great deal in terms of my perceptions, my perspectives. Um, issues that I, I want to talk about in my stories. They've suggested a number of them that I followed up on and have included, in fact, have been at the heart of some of my books. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I do a lot of reading in terms of the Ojibwe culture. Um, I, uh, I'm online a lot, uh, just checking in and finding out what's going on in Indian country so I, I can understand how I need to talk about certain issues in, in light of what's going on these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, st I try to stay in touch as much as I can with the Native community, both here in Minnesota and nationally. Mm -hmm. So how, how um, or not, not how, I would say, I want to frame this question. Um, the fact that you're a white man and you are writing a lot about Native peoples, how they think, what they're saying. I mean, the mind says, um, I love this, who sees the spider web in the night, so wait for the sun. I mean, that, that, that's really a wise piece of... Yeah, that didn't come from uh, uh, any of my Native friends. Okay. <laughs> when I'm writing about Henry Malou, um, his words just sort of spring from, I think, a deeper place than conscious thought, mm -hmm. some universal place that as a storyteller, you're always trying to touch. And I think that's where Henry Malou and his wisdom comes from. Wow. Very often, anyway. Yeah. Uh, you, you speak uh, in this uh, novel about Glen Garrow, is that how you say it? Right. Uh, and that's an estate owned by a wealthy white man. Right. Um, was that featured in earlier books? Because I, I I couldn't remember that. There is that. An, another estate that features prominently. Um, Aurora, Minnesota is in the Iron Range. Mm -hmm. My Aurora, Minnesota is right. in the Iron Range. And so uh, the history of the iron mining has been important in a number of the novels. Uh, and there are people in Aurora who uh, made an enormous amount of money because they own mines or shares of mines. Mm -hmm. One of the other estates that often has played a part in the story is the parent a state, mm -hmm. um, but this is Glengaro, a different estate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know we're getting close to the end of our time together. It's gone so quickly. Um, is there anything that I, I mean, there's lots of things I haven't asked you, but is there anything that you'd particularly like our viewers to know, either about you, about your series, about your next book, um, anything? Well, there are two things I want them to know, uh, particularly about my standalones. Uh, Ordinary Grace was followed up by a companion novel in uh, 2019 called This Tender Land. Mm -hmm. um, those two books, Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land, are probably, although I love the Cork O'Connor series, they're probably the best pieces of literature, uh, the best stories that I've written so far. My heart is so deeply um, embedded in those stories. So I hope readers who are familiar with one or the other will read the other one mm -hmm. uh, because they are companion novels. And I'm at work now on a third standalone that will be a companion to both of those. I don't have a title for it yet, but like Ordinary Grace in this Tender Land, it will be set in southern Minnesota rather than the northern Minnesota of the Cork O'Connor series. Mm -hmm. And it will also, like those two novels, be set in an earlier time. And I'm sure we'll deal with um, many of the same themes those two books deal with. Mm -hmm. I think I have that book here. I don't have, I don't have all of your books. I should, is, have, I should have brought a copy. No, it's not there. I should oh have brought a copy. I have it. I've read it. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't, I thought, well, I brought what I could carry. Let's put it like that. Um, so anyway, um, I... Uh, I think our time has come to a close. Oh my goodness, that was, I know. that was way too fast. I know, I know. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And um, I hope you'll come again, maybe when you've had your next book published. And good luck with Lightning Strike. And may it reach uh, the top of the 
New York Times bestseller list. Up from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> Thanks again. And now, Susan, back to you. Thanks, Barbara, and thanks, William Kent Kruger. What a lovely interview. We heard him say these things about Cork O'Connor. Cork understands that the family is the most important thing, just like him. That Cork always tries to do the right thing, even when he doesn't know what the right thing might be, just like William Kent Kruger. He seeks help when he has a conundrum, just like William Kent Kruger. I can understand how the people are such real people in his books to his readers, because he does imbue them with a humanity, failings, successes, um, conundrums. It's, again, beautiful storytelling. We learned in this interview that there is a follow-up or a companion book to Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land. We would look forward to having that come out and having him come back in and talk to us about that. Oh, yes. William Kent Kruger's books are available in any brick and mortar bookstore and online. Barbara and William Kent Kruger, thank you so much for being here today.